Hey everyone, how you guys doing today? Good, how are you? Good, March 1st already. Snow is melting up here every day, reclaiming more of my front yard <laughs> and my backyard. So, we're gonna do um, a new assignment today, but I thought we'd first start off um, by showing you what's possible. And I've got loaded up today in advance, unlike last week, <laughs> um, something that I just finished in the fall, late fall, uh, for a f film that was on the SEC channel, which is part of the ESPN networks. It was on last week a bunch of times, and it's called Once Upon a Comeback, and it's about an Olympic swimmer named Dara Torres. So I have up here um, the session for act uh, for the third act of the film, and there's like four... There's, several cues on this in this act but i've got the last f three or four cues of this act loaded in here and i thought i'd play some of it uh while sharing the screen and then uh talk talk about it hold on a second excuse me and uh one thing too that um uh, one thing i i don't know if i mentioned it in in this class last week or the other class but in uh my google drive uh, no, my Dropbox that there's the class information for. So it's difficult to really see the screen here. And I've got this at the largest resolution, my monitor, that I can get it to. So I did some research, and there is something called accessibility in system preferences for Apple. So I've got it set up now so that I can actually... Uh, scroll in and make things very large and scroll out. So I still have to get more practiced at it. Uh, I, in my previous class, I just did it for the first time and it helped, but I have to get better at you know doing it. And what happens is that I can't see my Zoom screen anymore, so I don't know how it's looking, so I'm sort of flying blind, but it does help. So the way I've got these lined up, and I know that a lot of you that are undergraduates that are just MAP people, you, you don't do orchestral music, and there's no problem. There's not not a problem with that. But I do a lot of orchestral music when I write uh, amongst or and electronic music and other things. But I've got this kind of set up as if it was an orchestral score on a manuscript paper. So what I mean by that is I've got the woodwinds up top, so I've got a couple of different articulations for the oboe. Short. Long. Whoops, excuse me. And then I've got a bassoon. And then I've got an ensemble high winds patch. Then, you know, some, some brass ensemble patches mid, mid range, which is probably French horns and some trombones, and then low brass. Now, sometimes when I'm writing, oftentimes I make them all out separate, but this wasn't really, this was sort of a hybrid, hybrid orchestral score. There's a lot of other elements in it. So I didn't feel the need, and there were no solo horn or solo brass. They were all textural. So I didn't really feel the need to separate them out. And I've got some, you know, some choir sounds in pink, some synthesizer sounds, a couple of different pianos. That's a felted piano, and then this is a regular piano. Lots of reverb on it, and... Some pitched percussion like glocks, glockenspiel, which are bells, marimba, xylophone, then some sound designed piano stuff. That's a ping pong ball on a string, piano strings being struck. Then percussion, drum kits, guitar harmonics, electric bass, and then all sorts of string, orchestral strings, different articulations, different size ensembles different effects, a cello-violin combination patch, and an upright bass. Oh, before I start, so I've got 50, 50 instrument tracks loaded, right, in, so...
So that's a short cue. Let's move to the next one, which is a little different. Okay, so a couple of things. This is in the middle, towards the end of the third act of the film. It's an hour long. So a lot of these themes, a lot of these themes, uh, there's a noise going on in the other room and I just wanted to hear what was going on, sorry. Um, a lot of these themes I had brought in earlier and these are reworkings of them. So all the little melodies you hear that flow into each other, they actually have a meaning uh, in, in the unfolding of the film. Now, a couple of things. Um, this is not final mix. I have final mixes, but I mix things. I render everything into audio. And um, these are all MIDI tracks. This is the rough mixes that I send to my clients. They still sound pretty good, you know, uh, because I mix as I go along. And a couple of things that um, I want to share with you. So I've got 50 instruments playing, right, uh, or loaded in here. And I don't have, though, 50 instruments playing all the time, right? You hear, like, this whole spot here, there's no, these instruments aren't playing. This instruments aren't playing till just a couple of spots over here, right? This instrument's only playing right here. Let me make those, let me uh, make that a little bigger for you. You can see, like, this instrument only comes in here, nowhere else. Same with this. Like, the the oboe only comes in in a few spots here, the bassoon in a few spots here, the high winds just in a few spots here and there. So this is, you know, this is part of crafting out an arrangement and an orchestration. And these principles where you don't have instruments playing all the time from the beginning of a piece to the end of the piece... Or if they are playing, they're doing different stuff. They develop. It's not the same thing over and over and over again. This is, you know, part of the principles of orchestration, excuse me, and arranging that are really 
you can really work on with this study. You can practice and, and experiment around and do all sorts of stuff. So I just wanted to expose that to you to show you what's possible with MIDI inside of a DAW, even Pro Tools, which is not known for being an uh, incredible MIDI sequencer. It is very capable. I went over this in the last class, but I'm going to go over it again. So right, these, this is our ruler area up here. And rulers measure things. And you could see this is my temp. The green one is my tempo ruler. You could see I'm changing tempos all the time. It's, it's to help out the feel of the piece. It's also to make it line up with the picture. And this is my meter. So I'm changing meters all the time. 4-4, four, four, 7 16, 5, 8, 5, 4, 3, 4, 15, 16. And the trick of doing this when you're doing a film score, measure of 9, 8, is to do it in a way that it flows naturally. So let's take it from here, right? And let me play the track. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, up. Right? So... In other words, this is actually four beats with one less sixteenth note. So instead of it being sixteen sixteenths, it's it's like a measure of um, three four and a measure of three sixteenths. But because the music is floating, you don't really notice that it's got a beat missing. It's got a sixteenth note missing. One, two, three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, one. Right? So this is a measure of nine eight, which I counted off nine eighth notes here. And you could see it just flew, f flowed naturally into the next section. So, uh, uh, you know, it's not essential that you change, tempo, change tempos and change time signatures, but you should know how to do that stuff. And then the last thing, and this, this is something that we'll, we'll be using, working on today, is you see this, this here with all the different colors. These are called memory locations, or as they're also called markers. And what they do is they mark up the session. So for me, when I'm writing a film score, right, let's, let's look at this right here. So this is 3M14, so the, that notation for film scoring means this is the third reel of film or the third act. So if it's a television film, it's broken up into acts because they sell commercials between acts. And then I've got M14, that's the number of the cue, it's the 14th cue in the film. And then I've got a couple of des adjectives descripting the, as descriptors for the kind of music. And then the next one I change right here. Change, tense, driving, undertone, <clears throat> competition. So these are on the timeline, and they give me the form. So how you might use something like this is, is that you might set up introduction, verse 1, verse 2, chorus, verse 3, verse 4, chorus, bridge, and, and you would notate those things. And the reason it's good is that you can see where the sections are. And as I'll show you um, later on, or I could show you now, actually, there is a window that we can get to here called memory locations. Let's go to the monitor here. Okay, memory locations. And it brings up all the memory locations, right? So if I was, let's say I was at measure one. So that's this 3M13. So if I want to go to the Q end, which is 16, what I would then do is I would take my numeric keypad and I would dial in decimal point, 16 decimal point, and you see that this jumped right to that spot on the timeline here. 
So if I wanted to get to M17, which is 26, I would do decimal point, 26, decimal point, and then you could see that the screen jumped here and my counter jumped as well. So it's good for navigating. So we're going to get into that as well. And the other thing that we will get into in class today is creating a leader bar. And what do I mean by that? So let me get right here and zoom in. So if you look at our counter, right, we're at bar one, beat one, which is right here. But if we look at our timeline up here, we're at six minutes and 58 seconds. That's what this says right up here. Right there, into the piece. So I'll teach you how to do that. And why would you want to do that? Well, that comes in handy when we're recording audio or you're scoring films and you want to move your bar one all around the um, timeline to fit in where the cue starts. All right, any questions on that? That was just sort of like a, this is what's possible. I wanted to spend a few minutes to show you this stuff and introduce you to a couple of, uh, of the topics that we'll be going over today. What we're going to go over today is adding a leader bar. We're going to go over the conductor track. We're going to do some more work with velocity editing. We're going to talk about MIDI merge. We're going to do a little bit of work with drum programming. And then I'll teach you how to um, also uh, markers. And I'll teach you how to render a track as an MP3. So those are all the topics we're going to go over today. And there's an assignment that'll be due in, there'll be a first draft due next Monday and the final draft done in, in two weeks from today. The beginning of this session starts right at the beginning of the um, timeline, right? Now, if you're recording live musicians, and it starts at bar one, if they come in like a fraction of a second early, you're going to chop off the beginning of the note. So back in the day when everybody was working in the st regular studio and there were reel-to-reel -reel tape machines, they used to have something called leader up front, right? So there'd be blank tape up front, and like 60 seconds usually. And so that um, if somebody came in a little bit early, you'd still be able to record, the, the instrument would still be captured. So there's a two method step for this in, in Pro Tools. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna figure out about the tempo of your song. And so to do that, the tempo right here, and I'm gonna tap on the T key right here to figure out a ballpark tempo. So. I want to write a piece that's bump, dump, bump, moderate tempo. Bump, 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 two and three and four and one and two and three and four. And so I'm somewhere in the mid 80s. So I'm going to just try 84. If I want to give myself a little pre roll before the beginning of the song and keep my measures all intact, I mean, obviously. You can start recording at measure three. That's fine. But I, I'm a musician, and I, when I'm looking at measure three, that means something in the phraseology of how a piece of music unfolds. Measure three doesn't mean it's the beginning of you know, the first bar. And like if you've got a pickup, something that goes one, two, three, ba -doo -da -da one, right? A little pickup figure. You want to have something like a, me like a measure before that, you have your little pickup that goes into the downbeat. So what you'll do is you, what I like to do is I like to give two bars up front. So I've got my tempo set. I'm going to type in three here. Okay. And then I'm going to go to the uh, event time operations and move song start. All right. And let me zoom in on this thing. So if I'm zooming in and you can't see what I'm doing, please let me know because I cannot, when I zoom in on the computer screen, the Zoom app disappears from my second computer screen. So I can't really tell um, if, it's, if, if it's lined up properly. I'm sort of just going by feel. So this is time operations. And obviously there's a few things in here that you can play around with. But right now we're going to move song start. And our time base is going to be bars and beats. 
And since we typed in three into the counter, three shows up here. And we want to renumber the song start to measure one. And since we have no other information down, we don't have to worry about this area here. All right. So for this class, this is all you have to remember. And then if you hit apply, and then if I zoom out, you can see that right here, measure one starts two bars into the session. So that means that we've got a measure zero before it and a measure minus one. So that's our two bars up front. So that's moving the song start, or that's giving a leader bar. So I'm at measure one. The song's going on. It's wonderful. I love this. So let's say at measure five, we want to change the tempo. So I put my cursor here, the playback head, or I just type in five right here. And then on the tempo ruler, if I click this plus sign, you see it says add tempo change. And this little box shows up. Snap to bar. Location is measure five. You can change that if you want it at this point. And if I wanted to make this two beats a minute faster, we've got 86. Type it in and then boom, 86. It's a little faster. And then let's say at measure nine, I wanted to slow it back down again. I could just add that in. So that's the conductor bar. And there's actually, you can do a little bit more work with that as well. And I'll show that a little bit later, I think. Um, now, why would you want to do that? Not keep things the same tempo from beginning to end. Anybody have a... Uh, oh. Go ahead, Tito. No, go ahead. You started. Um, I was just going to say I feel like it keeps it more a little bit like live music instead of just having a regular recording. Right. So back in the day, you know, 40 years ago before click tracks became ubiquitous, if you listen to songs, big hit songs, great songs, great performances, they're different tempos, They, but they're doing it as a unit. They're They're not just indiscriminately speeding up and slowing down. So even if it's a tune with a groove, right, the chorus could pick up a couple of beats a sec, a, a minute, and then relax down during the verse. And you could simulate that here. And it can give a little bit more life to your, to your music. Now, if you're writing an orchestral piece, right, there are things that are called, uh, there are, th this stuff happens all the time. But let's say I do this. If I add a piano track... All right, so let me uh, get rid of this for now. And let me start here. Uh, so now I, I'm going to start at one bar before and just start recording. Two, three, four. Right. So if I were to play that and somebody was conducting and it was the end of the piece, it might go something like this. Right? Now, I could play it in like that, but I wouldn't be lined up with the, with the timeline. But what you can do is, and let me zoom in, and let me actually get rid of myself and zoom in a little bit. What you can do is you can click right here on this triangle. That's the tempo editor expand and collapse. So you can open that up and it opens up the tempo editor. And let's take a look at this. So this is pretty big. This can be resized. If you hover at the bottom, the cursor turns into a cross and I can click and drag that up, right? Let me move this over. So right here it says 1,000, and down here it says 400. That's tempo, like beats per minute. You can change that by over here clicking on the plus. 
I mean the minus, which is at the bottom here, or the plus. Right? So get it someplace where you could see a lot, and then right here it's got a slider just so you can go up and down. So let's move this here, and then it lines up with the timeline. So if I wanted to do a, 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 a ralentando, in, which is slowing down into the end, I could just, and again, you're going to use the line tool, right, which is this one here. So you just click on that, and I want you to, instead of freehand, well, you're going to use the pencil tool to draw a line. You're going to select line. And then I'm just going to click here and drag down, and now it'll slow down. And you might have to experiment. And then maybe there might be a little bit more space here before the last note comes in. And then the opposite is true, too. So if you wanted to do something that started off a little slower and then speed up to this point, right, you can do something like this. Right, so that keeps everything lined up to the timeline. What I would say about that, and the most efficacious way to work, <laughs> no, the most efficient way to work, is to get your piece mapped out with a tempo that you can play at. For MIDI, when you do audio, it's a little different. But when you're just doing MIDI work like this, is to get your piece mapped out and all your parts played in well enough so that you just have MIDI editing to do, and then play around with the tempo. Because... Unless you're really experienced playing with the click. Oh, that's something else I want to go over today. Um, yeah. It becomes really hard to speed up and slow down and speed up and slow down, right? So if everything is steadier, you could just play along with the click and then adjust the tempo to your liking after you're done playing. Anyway, that's sort of the way that I work, and I find it to be the most time efficient. All right. Let's speak about click. Let's undo this for a second. And you can just highlight that, right? So if I just, no matter what tool is selected, if I hover up in the ruler area, it'll change to uh, a selector. I can just highlight, whoops, I can just highlight this like this, where just this stuff is selected and delete it. And then I can close this by cl clicking on this. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I see that. Okay. Sorry, my fault. Okay, so to get rid of this, I can just simply highlight that and delete. And then you can shut this down like this. All right, so let's talk about the click track for a second. So this right here is the click plugin. And if you click on it, it opens up. Lots of clicking going on. Right here, it tells you the tempo, which aligns to this. So if I were to change this, notice that the beats per minute here changes. Now. You can the, the, the sound that this comes with is horrible. You can change the sound. You do that by clicking here. And the one that I recommend and like is you go down to Classic, and then Yuri Click as Accented, ACC, and then you take the second one, same thing, and just go to Yuri Click. And this is the kind of click that was in real studios back in the day. So that's really nice. And what's even nicer about that, as opposed to the default one, is that when you're recording live audio, it won't leak out of your headphones and get captured by a microphone as easily as the other one. And it's not as piercing on your ears. So that's one thing about that. And what you can do, which is kind of cool, is you can save that as a preset so that when you open up, you can just click on this preset here and load it in. So the way you do that is you click on this circle with a downward facing triangle here, and you could save settings as, and it'll open up to this, um, to this menu here, and then you would name this, 
I already have one set up, so I'm going to name this Yuri Click 2. And then you save it. And then when you open your session, right, it'll, it'll come up with factory default, which is this horrible sound. You can just click here and change that to Yuri Click. And then you've got that much nicer, more professional sound. Okay, so how many of you are used to playing with a metronome? All right, so I've got this set at 60 beats per minute, right? So if I play it, and then boom, I'm in, right? So there's four beats and I'm in. Now, what some people will do is they'll do this, and they're waiting. Right? It doesn't fit in. What I would suggest you do is in your head or sing to yourself the part you're playing. So let's say I wanted to play something that went like... Right, so my left hand is doing what the click would be, and my right hand is playing what the right hand would play, and then my left hand would be the one, two, three, four, right? So you have to understand two things. Which notes that you're playing fit on the beat and, make and use those as anchor points and know what your subdivisions are. So if I was going to play... Let me play something even simpler. One and two and three and four and. And for graduate students, I know this is simple, but I've got, you know, the people that uh, a varied uh, technical ability. So th this is good review for everybody. So as the click track starts, one and two and three and four and one and two and three. Right? So before I started playing, I felt those in-between notes, or what we call the subdivisions of the beat. So the, the click starts, dun, 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 and then I come in. So let's try it. Two. So just see what I did then is that the first one, the third one, the fifth one, and the seventh one, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, those odd numbered ones all line up with the beat. So that's your target. So when you're listening, as you're playing, you're trying to make sure that those line up on the beat and that you try to fill in the notes evenly. One and two and three three and four and now let's look at something else if I wanted to play something that was a little bit faster than that right so th the beat is one and two I'm at 60 beats a minute So what I would do is taka 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 taka. So I'm off. So I'm gonna replay that click track. It's a little slower. Taka 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 taka. And what I'm doing to anchor it down is I know that my left hand is on one and three. So one E and the two E and the three. Right? So I'm playing one. Is, well, actually, my left hand is on is on every beat. One E and a two E and a three E and a four. So what I'm doing is I'm anchoring my left hand, using my left hand to anchor. Right? And then I'm making sure that the right hand is lining up with my left hand. So I'll do it again. One E and a two E and a three E.
Let me do it again, and I'll play my left hand louder. You'll hear what I mean by it's on the beat. Right? So you see how I anchored that bit with my left hand. Now, you know, it's, it's playing with a click is not really inspiring. You know, it's better to play with something that's got a bit of a feel to it. But if I'm doing orchestral music, I got to start out somewhere, you know. Um, it's not like I can just throw a drum loop up and jam along with it. All right, so I'm going to play something along with this click track, and then I'm going to do a few editing jobs to it. All right, so... I'm having you guys work in grid, but if we look at my whole performance here, we can see that I'm a little bit ahead of the beat all the time, right? So I could individually fix everything, but what works very well for something like this is to go into the second edit mode here, which is slip mode, all right? So we're, this is... We're going to use three edit modes this semester, grid, slip, and shuffle. But shuffle we'll get into when we start editing audio. But we have grid, and we're using the blue grid, not the purple grid. So you just click on it again to make it blue. So you click here for slip, and the key, if you've got an ex, like a functions, it's F2. F4 is grid, and F2 is slip. I could use my grabber tool, and let me just zoom in right? I could simply take this and everything selected, click, and just slide it all so that this part is lined up on the grid. And it's magic. The rest of my piece is in pretty good shape with relative to the grid, so I won't have to do any work. So that's one way to fix the timing. There are, there are many ways to fix timing, right? And um, I'm going to show you more MIDI editing next week, but I have a f like an agenda for today that I want to get through. And we talked a little bit about editing velocity last week. Right here, there's a little triangle. If you click on that, it opens up the edit lanes. Now, if you have multiples that open up, you can simply click right here on this minus sign and remove it. You, I only want you to have one open. I sometimes have multiple open, but really I could do everything in one. And this can be resized. If you hover here, you can make this bigger or smaller. If you click here, you've got all these different sizes that you can select. And if you, this box here with the little downward facing triangle has, for our purposes right now, a bunch of MIDI parameters that we can edit. If I click here, it's got MIDI volume, MIDI mute, MIDI pan, pitch bend, mono aftertouch, program change, sysx, which we don't have to worry about. So the only ones that we should wor we'll be wor working with, velocity, volume, pan, and here... Well, you can't see that because of the zoom. Let, let me zoom out. At the bottom of this, it's got sustain pedal, right? So, because I use the sustain pedal. Now, all right. Now, in this edit lane here, right, you can resize these MIDI notes. And let me show you how you do that. You see right here, yeah, I'm, see, I'm getting better the more I do it. Let me lose myself. I don't have to, you don't need to see me. This has MIDI zoom in and out, right? There's, there's left and right zoom with the R and the T key. But up and down, you see that there's two MIDI notes here represented. If you click on the bottom of this box, 
you see how they get smaller? And if you click on the top of the box, they get bigger. So we want to fit everything into there so that we can see it. Now, let me play this again. And I can move this over a little bit more. Now, one other setting, too, is did you notice that how when it went past where the screen was, it flipped the page almost? You can set that up. Uh, let's see. You could set that up right here. Scrolling. And I have scrolling set to scroll page. All right. There's a thing. And I might have gone over this last week, but when you're playing an instrument that's polyphonic, like a piano or like a guitar or harp, you want to do something called voicing. Now, for those of you that are graduate jazz students, you think of voicing, when you hear voicing on a piano, you're thinking of chords and how you, the alignment of notes. And that's true. But there's also something called voicing because there should be an unequal distribution of volume between the notes that you're playing if you're playing a chord. So typically what that means is that the extremes of or the extremities are the loudest notes and then the, the stuff that's inside is not quite as loud. So let me just show that very quickly by playing a passage twice. Right? Eh. Eh. It was horrible. Now, I exaggerated that, but basically what I'm doing when I'm playing is I'm putting a little bit more emphasis on my pinky, and what's happening is that the velocity, I'm putting more weight onto my extremity my right hand and that's causing and I'm putting less weight on the in, inside part of my right hand and that's causing the note to go the velocity of the note the key to go down faster and that velocity is mapped here with the sound into volume making it louder so in other words if I would just play and if I were to play two notes at a time Right, those both the same volume, but if I played right, you can hear that my top note right, you can hear the follow the top line, and that's called voicing. So when I play this piece back here. It's weak, right? It's played poorly. So what we want to do, musically speaking, is get what's our melody. So it's... Right? So there's a couple of ways to do that. But what we're going to do right now is I'm going to take a listen. Okay, so that beginning, this note here is too loud. So I'm going to bring the velocity of this down. Now, I could, using the grabber tool, highlight this and hold the command key down, and that changes to a sideways trimmer. And I think we went over this last week. I could just drag that down. But notice here, this is highlighted white. I can just click and drag that down. It does the same thing. So... And right here, the same thing here. So right here, this is way too soft. So I can bring this up. And these, these two notes are too loud. So I can, so if I click and 
lasso those like that. They're both selected. I could click on either one of these down here and bring that down. This could be a little louder. See, I'm listening. Okay, so here, this is a little too loud. I'm listening and making judgments. This is not loud enough. That's too soft. And these, these are too loud, so I'm going to bring those down. And this is, these two are too loud also. So I'll bring those down. So, you know, if I was playing a real piano, it's easier for me to control my dynamics on a real piano than it is, even though this is a great weighted keyboard, it's just not the same as playing a real instrument. So you have to do some editing to really make it speak beautifully. Okay, so these two were too loud, right? So I could bring those down a little bit. Right, and then you, so you can hear now that there's multiple levels of activity happening here. You've got a melody, you've got these slightly arpeggiated figures, and you've got a bass line. It's too soft. Now, let's say you've got that done and you still think that it sounds a little harsh. You can click and just drag and select everything or you can just click in this field here and do Command A and everything in that track gets selected. And you could bring down the velocity of everything. Just like that. And it does it proportionally. See, and that's got a different feel than what we did before. Much different feel. So that's one thing. So let's say that um, I wasn't a pianist and I'm going to play a few things in and then we're going to use some editing techniques to make what I played better. That's horrible. <laughs> Let's see about fixing that up. All right, so a couple of things. First of all, there's some bad notes, so let me get rid of those. That would be... This one here, and this one here, unless you're Thelonious Monk, and that would be a great note, and it would be a great note. So my timing is really bad, but it's all over the place, right? So I'm playing all eighth notes on here. One and two and three and four and one and two. So. I could I I had you go and individually work up each note and you could do that and that would be fine. But 
let's say I wanted to do a little bit quicker. So I could just click and drag across and lasso all those notes. And now we're going to use the key command, option, and the number zero. And that could be this zero as well. And that brings us up the quantize event operations window. So when you quantize something, you're basically putting it onto a set defined value. And what we're going to quantize here is the note on, and we're going to preserve the note duration. Let me zoom in on that. Professor, how did you get that again? What key command was it? Option and the number zero. And also, if you can't remember that, you go to event, and you go to event operations, and then you select quantize up here. But option zero, uh, commands, wait, hold on. <laughs> yeah, option zero. Let me zoom in on this again. You can now see that a little better. So this is our event operations window. And you notice there's a little gray box here with a triangle. And that means there's another, uh, in Pro Tools, that means that there's an, another menu underneath that. And it's got all these different functions here that we can play around with. But for our class, we're just going to do some basic quantizing. So what we want to quantize, the note on, that's the, where the note starts on the grid. Don't worry about note off. Let's preserve our note duration. And the quantize grid, I would set it to the lowest value of the note you're playing. So I said that I was playing eighth notes here, which is two notes per beat. Bump, 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 bump. And again, graduate students, I'm also doing undergraduates that aren't music majors. So I got to explain some of this stuff in a little bit more detail for them. So I'm going to go right here to my quantize grid and change that to eighth notes. And as an aside, if you had trop triplets, you could click this and make any kind of tuplet you want. So if it was quintuplets, you could put five in the time of four, whatever you want. All right? Oh, that didn't change to four. Four. Anyway, you could do that. But we're just sticking with eighth notes. Now, let me hit apply and see. And let me zoom in a little bit. And you could see all these notes are off the grid. So if I hit apply. Boom, they all snap to grid. Ah, but well, what happened there? So one of my notes was so off that it snapped to the wrong grid right here. So I would basically, I would just have to slide that over, that one note over and fix that one note. All right, so I'm going to undo all of that. What I think is real, that, that sounds very mechanical to me, and there are some musical styles where things are mechanical, but if you want to just get your rhythm a little better, but not make it too mechanical, you have some options here. So if we click on strength, it, at 100%, it'll get it right on the grid. If... I move this knob or the slider, it will get it 90. Now I'm at 90. Oh, you can't see that. Sorry. So if I move this slider here, it will now get it 75% closer to the closest grid or, you know, 85% closer to the grid. So let's zoom in and see what happens. All right. So this is off. It's almost by the last 16th note. And you notice it's closer to the grid, but it's not, not perfectly on the grid. And that might be all you need. I'll still have to fix this one note. And that might be all you need to make it sound better, but not mechanical. All right, so that's using the quantize. Let me, let me explain that again. All right, so let me get rid of this note. All right, so you're going to select all these notes and you're going to quantize. So you're going to do option and the number zero. And this is our quantize, right? It's part of the event operations because every one of these notes is a, a MIDI event with many parameters to it. 
we want to quantize the note on, preserve note duration, and our quantize grid, we could set it up to all these different parameters. And if we wanted to get a triplet, like an eighth note triplet, we would select eighth note and then select triplet. So it's a two-step. And then make sure that you deselect triplet to go back to there. Or if you are dotted an eighth note, we could do that. And then you have to deselect it. So we could make it perfectly on eighth notes. Or what I suggest to do is pick one of your options, strength, and make it somewhere between 85 and 90%. And that will get things closer, but still maintain some of your human feel, which will make for a better sounding performance. And then with this one, we just have to fix that note there. Now, the reason I had you guys doing things manually is because you have to develop mouse technique. You have to learn how to use the trimmer and the grabber tool and move things around because things come up where you don't want to just quantize everything. You just want to fix a couple of notes. And, you know, to use the grabber tool and slide things around, it's, it's, much, it's, it's, a, it's a technique that you need to have. And also when you're editing audio, using the grabber tool and slide things around or using the trimmer tool, uh, to trim things off, th those are techniques that you're going to have to develop then. All right. So now, all right. So what about the quality of how this is played? Right? It's all loud. So I could go through and manually adjust the velocity for each note, but let's explore using our friend the pencil tool, which is right here. So you can get to the pencil tool by holding command and hitting the number six, right? Command and number six, or you could just click on it. Now, the pencil tool, if you hold it down, right, click on it, um, let go, you could see it's got all these shapes. Until you get a little bit more experience, what I want you to select is the line. That's the easiest to learn how to use the pencil tool. All right. So let's say I wanted to start off softer. Now, instead of manually grabbing and moving everything up and down, I can use the pencil. And make sure that none of these notes are selected if you're going to use the pencil. And I would start a little bit before. Click. I'm holding the click down. And I'm going to make... I'm going to make this first thing softer, and I'm going to make it crescendo. I'm going to make it all softer. So I could just click and drag across, and now everything is the same velocity, but it's softer. Right? So that sounds better than before, but it's still, eh. So there's two ways that you can play this, right? The first way is you could do a gradual crescendo up to here. Well, there's many ways you could play it, but two of the ways that you could play it is you could, the first one would be that you could do a gradual crescendo up to here and then soft and then crescendo up to there. So what I would do is something like this. Start a little bit before the velocity and I'm just going to click and hold it up and draw up a nice crescendo like that. And then the same thing here, right? And now we've got some dynamics. Oh, this first note should have been loud. Okay. Yeah, a little interesting note there, right? Okay. That's one way to play it. Another way to play it is... You've got these notes here. You got a pattern. So you got So you got bam bam then ba 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 ba, right? So you could bring out a little rit phrase like this. Right? Where you make those gradually louder. So let me use my pencil tool. And I'll be delicate here, and I'll just draw up like this, right? And then I want... So it's not working as well as I want it to, so I'm just going to make things a little bit more exaggerated.
right? So, so you could see how using the pencil tool and quantizing, if you're not a skilled keyboard player, you can create something that will be much more musical than the way that you would normally put input something. All right. Um, yes, go ahead, uh, Tito. Um, so there's more than one way, of course, like you said to use the pencil. One is through the velocity, uh, like right on the bottom. But you also used it before as a tool to like crescendo and decrescendo things where you actually, because I, 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 the, the last time you used it was uh, I, on that bottom section that says velocity. Right, that's where I'm using it now. Okay. Yeah, that's where I use it. Uh, now you can, do, right? We did that with the um, with the pencil tool. I used it also in the tempo m map, I believe. Uh, that's right. Okay, that's what right? it was to make things go faster and sl like to speed up and slow down, as opposed to having something be one tempo, and then at measure four jump to another tempo and then back down to the original tempo. I did something which you would use in classical music. I played something on the piano, and at the end of the piece, I did a little ralent. I slowed down a little bit, right? Remember, I went. Um, yeah, that's right. I, just, I played uh, it all at one tempo, and then I drew in the ralentando so that everything would stay aligned with the bars and beats. Okay. All right. All right. So up here, when we click on this, we've got all these selections, right? So I've got key selected and chords I don't have selected. So let me select chords. And what you can do in Pro Tools is you can make a dummy, like a very basic chord track. And if you're writing an original piece of music, that your chords might be your outline and you can follow along. You don't have to remember what they are. Now, look up here when I play. Let me get the cursor out of the way. See that? It says C. So I'm playing a C major chord. Now if I play this, C major 7th. If I play this, F minor 6, 9. If I play this, D7 sharp 9. It's pretty good, you know? B augmented 7th with a sharp 9th. Now let's see if I can fool it. Yeah, see, that's crazy. So, there we go. So it doesn't do inversions with these extended chords really well, but if I play that, right, C with an E in the bass, it does that. C with a G in the bass. So that's very helpful. I'm going to do this twice. Okay. Now, you notice when it's playing back, it doesn't tell you what the name of the chord is, right? So, my first chord is C major 7th. Now, if I forgot what I played and I open up my MIDI editor, well, I can click on the notes and sort of figure out what that is. But what if I wanted to see notation? Okay. Now, Pro Tools um, has very basic notation. It's not as well developed as, uh, as Logic or Cubase or Digital Performer, which all have very good built-in notation programs. What Avid wants you to do is they want you to spend the money and buy Sibelius because you can send your MIDI tracks right to Sibelius from Pro Tools and then edit away to your heart's content with a professional notation program, which I find to be incredibly tacky. And that's putting it mildly, but that's Avid for you. Anyway, there is a notation page, but right here in the MIDI editor, if we look here on the toolbar, we've got a little something right here. looks like notes. So if I click on that, we've got notes, right?
the notes I've played. Now, I'm going to go over notation in more detail next week a little bit. But from here, I can see what my chords are. So if I go to measure, and I'm going to turn off this red button here, so this will stay like this. But I'm going to go right here and go to measure one, and I know that this is a C6-9 chord. So if I click on my chord marker, C, and then look here, and C, 6 added 9. And there you have it. This one here is an F2 chord. So let's so oops, not key change, chords, F, and then click here and look for the quality. I mean, it's got F add 9. There you go. Then the third, third one is a B flat major 7th. So my chord is a B flat major minor, 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 major 7th. Okay, so that's that's it with the fancy chords, and then you can just highlight that and delete it to get rid of it. Let me select all these. Uh, let me play some simpler chords, and I'll leave the notation window open. So those are all triads, no seventh chords at all. They're just major or minor chords. We have one in first inversion. So what we can do here is we can go to measure one, and we can just pop in D major. Measure two. Click here, and that's a G major. Measure three has two chords in it, so a beat one. That's a, and you can move this around by clicking and holding on that. That is a B minor, so B, like boy, and then minor. And then at beat three, it's an A major. So I click on beat three, notice it's right here. Click on the chord. So that's, I said it was a uh, A major. And then the next chord is a G major on the downbeat. Right, you can just go through the song like that. Now, let me show you something that's also cool about this. If I use my selector tool and I selected that, right, I can copy that. Command C, and let's say the B minor chord comes in here, I can just paste that there. So once you get a few of the chords for the song in, you don't have to keep on clicking on this. You can just copy and paste those wherever you need to have them be. Uh, which part, Tito? Do you want me to do one more time? Just how you pulled up the notation, because sometimes I can't see where the, where the mouse goes. Um, oh, really? It's funny because I made the mouse so much bigger this time, too. No, I, I can see it, but when it's moving around sometimes, I like, you know. Okay, no problem. And you're really quick. You're really fast. You're good at this. So it's like hard to find. The, uh, to you know, it's you. funny because I'm going to slow. I'm going really slow. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> taking my time. Okay, so right, this, this is. So we're going to open up the MIDI editor. You know how to do that, correct? Yes. Okay, okay so over here right above where the word tracks is, there's a little 
notation window display enable. It's two sixteenth notes or two eighth notes. It looks like. Click on that, and it turns opens up the notation window. I got it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for asking that because I'm sure you're not the only one who was wondering where that was. You gotta be brave. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Now, I'm gonna do notation a little bit more next week, but let's say you wanted to print out sheet music for this. This doesn't look good, right? So what we can do is we can select all of this and we can quantize this, right? Let me zoom in a little bit, whoops. I can quantize the note off, right? And I might have to do this in steps. No, so if I make it in a quarter note, let's see what happens. Right, that's better. That's better, but let me make it a half note. That looks pretty good except for the first chord, which we're going to make. We're going to quantize that to a whole note. And then you would have something that you could print out and somebody could play that for you. Now, I'm going to get a little bit more advanced in this next week. But I just wanted to give you a little taste of that to start off with. So that's quantizing the note duration. One more time. Option, zero. Now, in general, we want to preserve our note duration. But if we want to set up a piece of sheet music to print out, to send to somebody, right? We want to quantize the note off. So... I'm playing, you know, half whole notes and half notes here. So I'm going to change this. I played around, but I, you know, and also the strength should be 100%. I'm going to make it half notes. And then that fixed everything except the very first chord because I didn't play that long enough. So let me uh, select this and let me make that into a whole note. And apply. Now, there's another way to do that using um, uh, note durations and making the sustain pedal events into durations, but that's really complicated. Let's just stick with the basics for now. All right. So I've got. Um, now, if I wanted to print this, right? I'll show you that next week because that gets into something completely different. Now, I want to show you something that will help you with your drum programming. Let me get rid of all this stuff. So I'm going to install Expand 2, uh, Instantiate. And Expand 2, I'm going to go here to the factory presets and I'm going to pick drums and, you know, they're okay. I'm just going to pick session drums because it's a nice clean drum set. And I'm going to rename my track. Now, you know, you know, I can sort of, um, you know, fake around. I wouldn't call myself a finger drummer at all. I could play a couple of rock beats on the drums with my fingers like that. So what do I do, right? Well, what you can do is two things. You can create a different drum track for each instrument, and that's okay. So you can make one drum track for your hi-hats, one for your kick drum, and one for your snare drum, and one for your tom-toms, etc. Or you can do something called MIDI Merge. What MIDI Merge does is it allows you to record something onto a MIDI track and then do a second record take and record a, a second part on top of the original without erasing the original. So let me show you what I mean by that. So if I start here at measure zero, and I'm just going to play a, a kick drum on eighth notes, right? Okay, and let me zoom in. Now, if I want to, if I go to record again, and I want to add a snare drum, 
Watch what happens to that kick drum. You see, it erases it. It records over it. That's standard recording. What you can do with MIDI merge is I could have played that kick drum and then played the snare drum and then played the hi-hat. So MIDI merge is right here. See that? It's got a, a long, an arrow and then like two, like a road merging, right, when you're driving. So click on that, and that becomes active. I'm going to speed this tempo up a little, too. Let's go to 72. All right, so I'm going to, now I'm going to record. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find my hi-hat, which is right here. And I'm going to lay down a pulse with the hi-hat. Then I'll do the kick drum, and then I'll do the snare drum. And I can just record them on top of each other. Okay, let me now record my kick drum. And now I'm going to record a nice snare drum. I think I'll use this one. Okay, now I'm going to do that all again, just to reiterate that. So the first thing I'll do is I'll do my hi-hats. And, you know, I found the pitch, right, on all these drum kits, they're all mapped out the same way. Now, if you've got a small keyboard, like one of these small guys here, I should tell you this, right? If you've got one of these small keyboards here, there should be a switch that says octave plus and octave minus, right? So you may have to change the octave by pushing that switch to transpose the keyboard down to get it into an area where it can play these low notes. If you've only got a, a 32 key or a you know 48 key keyboard, I think a 48 key keyboard will get down to that note on its default setting. So on all the drum kits in Expand, C is the kick drum, C sharp is the cross stick, these two are snares, clap, and then these are toms, and then this is a closed hi-hat, a foot hi-hat, and an open hi-hat, and then cymbals, and then I've got the tambourine, some guiro, and some hand percussion. So it's all mapped out the same on almost all those drum kits. It's called uh, general MIDI mapping. So let me record my drum part again. So I'm just going to do eighth notes in the uh, hi-hat. So this is my closed hi-hat. Two and three and four and... And then I'll do my kick drum. And then I'll do my backbeat. Great. And now if I want to fix that, I can highlight that here. And then I can option. Oh, whoops. Jeez, you guys got to tell me when I, I have the wrong monitor on. <laughs> All right. So if I want to fix that, option zero, I can quantize here. So if I make, I don't want note off, and I played eighth notes, and we're going to do our strength at 90% and hit apply. And so you can quantize right here in, the, in this window. I don't expect any of you guys to know this, but there are incredible musicians that you've heard play on songs your whole life and you don't know who these people are 
and it's it's not as prevalent now, but when I was your age, and even l- into my you know into my thirties, um, and when I was a child, certainly it was there were you know these people were playing on all these songs, this f- small group of people playing on so many songs. Um, and anyway, in Los Angeles, in, in the United States, there were um, several areas that recorded music was made. And those areas were New York, Los Angeles, and then ten- uh, Nashville, obviously, for country music. But some of the other areas, Detroit, Philadelphia, Memphis, Muscle Shoals, Alabama, a small little town in Alabama. And each one of these places had a certain sound. So, um, for example, Detroit is Motown. So all the great Motown songs that your parents and maybe your grandparents, some of you, loved in the 1960s were recorded by a group of about 10 musicians and then all the singers. And they had like two or three guys playing that would be piano players on different sessions and sometimes... One guy would play piano, another guy would play organ, and another guy would play celeste. And then they had a, 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 two or three drummers, and sometimes this drummer played a better shuffle beat than this drummer, so he would play. Or sometimes they'd have two of them playing at the same time, and then sometimes one of the drummers would be playing drum kit, and the other one would be playing maybe a tambourine. They had three guitar players on every song, and they would divide up the guitar parts. And... You know, this is sort of the way it was in Los Angeles. There was this thing called the Wrecking Crew that played on, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hit songs. And there's actually a really good documentary. And there's also a great documentary that you could see for free on YouTube about uh, Muscle Shoals, which is even more amazing. But in Los Angeles, the Wrecking Crew was, you know, basically the 1960s. And then new generations sort of came in that were younger and by the mid-1970s, you had a certain group of people there. And this, this guy that's going to be playing here, Jeff Porcaro, he's one of the great drummers of the era, and he's no longer with us. And then he eventually, he's played on hundreds of records. He's played on everything from a guy named Boz Skaggs, uh, Sonny and Cher. He played on Michael Jackson's Thriller album, which is one of the biggest selling albums ever. And, and uh, Michael McDonald, all these albums after albums after albums. And then he got into this band called Toto, which just had, you know, they, they're still active now. Um, and they had their big hit in the late 70s while he was still doing sessions and he was in this big pop band. So he's doing an instructional video here. And I want you to listen to like, you know, how he describes what different parts of the drum kit do. And we'll listen to about five minutes of it. All right, so let's talk about that for a second. My other camera, the battery went on me. Oh, well. So one thing to get out of that bit that I want you to get is that there are basically, for doing pop music, there are three instruments that you're going to be working with, which would be the kick drum, snare drum and the hi-hat. You could do a lot of stuff when you're programming drums, right? But one thing he's talking about there is right, where you accent those notes. So he was doing one, one, two, right, on every beat. Then he was doing it on the half notes. One, two, And then you could see how those, the different accents make the drum beat feel differently. Right? So if we got. So the first one where I'm accenting every quarter note, that actually moves forward. It moves the beat forward more. As opposed to this. This is more like waiting. You know, something, you know, it's like not driving forward, it's waiting, even though they're both playing eighth notes. So where you're accenting the note will really help you in terms of how you're, um, 
performance it's going to sound. So let's go back to the uh, uh, monitor here. Let's do a little bit more work with our MIDI editor. Now you can see I've done a little bit of that work already with my accenting my hi-hat, right? Let me speed this up. So if I were to just mute these, right, so you can hear. Now, if I wanted to exaggerate that more, I could hold down um, the shift key and just lasso these alternate notes like this. And then bring the velocity of all those down even more. And I can get... You can really hear the effect of that. Now, I didn't make them all the same velocity, right? I kept some of my performance, but I just exaggerated the range of the dynamics. Now, if I make... Let's say I make the kick drum active. The same thing with the kick drum. It's not, it's not, but it's, right? Bam, bam, bam. You're phrasing into a beat. And that's very important in the unfolding of music is learning about phrasing into a beat. So in other words, if you're playing bam, 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 it's not bam, 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 it's bam, ba dum bum, da da, or if you're playing a figure that goes bump, bum, right? You're phrasing towards that last note. And that's sort of what we can we can simulate here. I did it a little bit, but basically these in-between notes here, right? I want to bring the velocities of those down so that I can get a little bit more phrasing there as well. And then I got my cross stick here, and let me make that active. And that's too loud. I'm ba it's way too loud. So let me just take that and bring make that all softer. And that sounds much better. Now, let's talk about the function of these three instruments, right? The hi-hat gives you, like, the groove and the pulse, right? That's what he was talking about with that low inner lope, where, depending upon how you accent notes and the kinds of notes you play, whether they're 8th or 16th notes, it creates the, a feel. And that's the function of the hi-hat as far from my perspective. Now, the kick drum, right? So how many of you know anything about um, Afro-Cuban music, right? There's something called a clave, and it's either a 2-3 or a 3-2, meaning bop, 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 or bop, 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 right? You've all heard that. that rhythm. And it's even in pop music, it's called the Bo Diddley beat, right? Even though it was, um, he, he appropriated it from New Orleans second line music. But it's, it's very, it's everything is written around that pattern, that beat. That's the lock, the, like the, the glue that holds everything together. It's the foundation. And that's what the kick drum is like. The kick drum is sort of like the heartbeat, right? So if I were to, you know, boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 right? And then if I were to play, right, if I were to play a bass line that goes along with this beat, right, it wouldn't be... It could be that, but it would probably be something like, it would probably be something like this. Uh, let's, let me start one measure before so I can get into the groove.
right? I'm playing around with the bass line. Now that's too loud, so let me bring the MIDI volume down. Right, so you can hear that the bass line, right, is directly related to how, what the kick drum is playing. And then the cross stick, that's, uh, that's on what's two and four, that's called the backbeat, right? So that's giving you a, so a solid anchor. Right, that's giving you like the thing that's gonna bop your head a little bit. Now, I'm going to do a little bit more work with drum programming next week, but I want to go over the assignment with you. All right, so we're going to sequence another song in Pro Tools using virtual instruments. Now, undergrads, you're going to use one or two tracks for the melody of the song. Oh, I've got, I've got a mistake there. Let me fix this. So at least six tracks. So you're going to use one or two tracks for the melody of the song, two or three tracks for the harmony, one track for the bass line, and one track for the rhythm. So that's at least six tracks in total. The song must be th about three minutes or 64 bars long. It, you know, if you're coming a little short, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Include markers and chord symbols. Do your best with the markers and the chord symbols. We haven't gone over the markers yet. We'll go over that week. This song must be different from the song used for the previous MIDI assignment. Graduate students, the same, but using 10 tracks in total, right? And just distribute the instruments as you would a regular arrangement. Now, if I have two tracks playing the melody, right? They don't play the melody the whole time. Sometimes it's instrument A, sometimes it's instrument B, sometimes they're both playing together. Sometimes you might have the instrument come in and play a, a harmony line, right? And if there's songs playing chords, harmonies, Right, instruments, maybe during the verse it's one instrument, and during the second verse, it's uh, the chorus, it's a different instrument. So you, they don't have to play, that's why I showed you the, uh, that, that film score piece at the beginning of the class, to just to show you that things, if I say a certain number of tracks, it doesn't mean that they have to be playing the entire time all the way through. Now, if you're an undergraduate and you want something a little bit more challenging, you can do the graduate uh, assignment as well. Um, there's one person in here who's thinks that the assignments are too easy, so I'm going to, you know, let him choose this if he wants. And um, the way I'd like this to work is I want your first draft in next week. I'm going to give you feedback, and then you'll finish it. And we'll finish up with more editing and ways to work on a track next week. So just get a rough draft up. Just It doesn't have to, you know, just get something up for me for next week. And I'll show you some more techniques for for, for uh, quick, more quickly copying and pasting uh, different clips to, to build out your arrangement next week. So get started on this. Um, there was an assignment due today. I'm missing 11 assignments. Please get them in by tomorrow. Wherever you are in the assignment, get it in. Please don't let it be unhanded in because it will count against you. If you hand it in, I can give you feedback. And if you want to you know, revise your piece, um, you can do that for a revised grade, but get something in on, get things in on time. Professor, do you have a, uh, a do you, when you want the assignments in, I know it's by the, the, the same day that we have the class. Is there a specific time? Like no, midnight? no, you can even get it in to me the next day because I'm, you know, I, up on Tuesday if, if you want, because I, I, it's looking like I can get to your stuff on Wednesday. That's looking what my schedule is going to okay. be like. And I do my record audio maybe one on Tuesday, but just get them in like, by, you know, it, it could be tonight at midnight. It could be tomorrow morning. That's fine. Um, just, just and not. the first assignment, just to be clear, that was six tracks, right? Yeah, for okay. graduate students, right. So yeah. you're just doing, you know, the more of these that you do, the better you'll get at solving the problems, the more fluid you'll get. So this will probably be the last MIDI assignment, and then we're going to move on to audio after this. Um, yeah. All right. So any questions on this? Professor, can yes. you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, Steve. Um, so I, I was still having those issues with my um, paid for or not paid for subscription. I bought a full subscription over the weekend. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out, I did submit an assignment to you 
but I do not believe I submitted it correctly because now I'm navigating through the. Okay, so I'll uh, now that you, and, 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 so I, okay, so this is let's see, I don't have the speaker view, so this is uh, uh, uh let me see, hold on, Eve, is that correct? Yeah, I'm just having a hard time um, with when I save the file, then again, finding the uh, container for it as you were showing us with the file. Um, okay, so the file. all right, so I'll email you about that. All right, Eve. Okay, yeah, I can also go back and, and watch the videos. It's just I'm not seeing the things that you were showing, but it could just be because now I'm navigating through um, the more expanded format of the program. Yeah, probably. Right, as opposed to the uh, freebie that you, the Pro Tools first you were using, where you couldn't really save things online, and had you uh, do an ex uh, a, um, uh, a standard MIDI file. It's, right now, I remember. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just okay, and if thanks. I if I don't get back to you, email me to remind me. Okay, I'm just uh, a little overwhelmed with outside work right now. All right. So everybody, uh, just you know, do the best you can, and we'll keep moving forward. All right. Thanks, Professor. Have a great Have a great evening. Thank you so much. And I'll get I'll get the review video up by Wednesday. Somebody else had a question. Uh, yeah. So I I like just got the uh, Pro Tools hard drive or flash drive, and I'm just like trying to figure out because I'm starting like from the day one assignment. Yeah. So if you've got issues with that, get in touch with Justin because I'm not sure what he sent you. Uh, right. I, I'm, I'm actually like, I, I'm good. I have like, uh, I just during this class downloaded the effects, the instrumentals, everything like that. So I'm good there. It just might take like a solid right. amount of time. So just, just email project. me, just email me th that you've, that that's what's going on. So I have it uh, like a, you know, I can, I can refer back to it instead of trying to okay. rem remember everything. All right. Okay. That would really help me out. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to. You know, it's a. It's a crazy situation. I'm trying to be reasonable and help everybody out. If we were all in the same classroom together, this would be a, a lot easier. Um, but you know, people have been learning. People have been getting stuff done, and there are actually a few things that are better online uh, than in person. But you know, getting started is really difficult because. And I'm going to try to fix that for next semester uh, by making sure that people contact me before the semester starts. Uh, when they, uh, that they know have to have to do that when they register, so um, as opposed to this time, and the last the last couple of times, and the, you know it gets to be like we're a month into the semester and people are just getting started, so it's not good for everybody, and I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying what is. So just do the best you can, and we'll get through the semester. Everybody have a great night, and I will catch you next week. Professor, sorry, yes. I have a really quick question about the assignment due in two weeks. Um, we have to pick a new song, right? Correct. Okay. A totally new song. Got you. Thank you. Yes. And it's, it's going to be the first draft due next Monday. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Great. Yeah, yes. Question. Yes. I'm please sorry. ask questions. No, don't. Don't. Hi. Um, I never received feedback on my first week assignment. So um, I was wondering, and um, I emailed you, but I. Okay. Uh, email me again, and I will go look at it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep, have no a great problem. Yeah. Just, just definitely if I've, if I've. Not gotten back to you. Definitely ask me questions, please. Great. Thank you. All Have right. a good night. Bye-bye.